So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, depending where you are, and welcome to today's Future of Financial Information webinar. It's my great pleasure to welcome Gerard Hoberg from University of Southern California, who will be our speaker today, as well as Jessica Jeffers from the University of Chicago, who will discuss. So uh, fun fact, um, when I first uh, got in touch with uh, Jared to, to present in this uh, series, I was uh, mindful of the, the time difference and I suggested that he presents actually in our previous episode two weeks ago because then the time difference would have been one hour less. Um, but uh, Jerry explicitly asked for April 7th because he said it's um, wellness day at USC. So it seems like his idea of wellness is to get up at 6 a.m. and then be in front of a camera giving a webinar at 7. Um, so uh, we certainly don't mind. Um, we're very uh, happy to, to have you here. And um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, rules. So uh, Jerry will present for about 30 minutes, followed by Jessica's discussion for about 15 minutes and then we'll proceed with a Q&A session with the audience. Uh, but please don't sit on your questions uh, until then. Uh, feel free to post them in the chats. Uh, I will be keeping an eye on the chat and I will make sure to, to come back to your questions at the end. And if we see uh, many questions popping up uh, during the talk, uh, we, might, uh, we might actually stop briefly to, to address some of them. So now without further ado, uh, Jerry, please, the screen is yours for 30 minutes. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, is everybody seeing the slide deck here? Okay, let's see, it works. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here. And um, time aside, uh, feeling very well and uh, really uh, great to see so many familiar faces here. So. Uh, this here is a, is a paper about life cycles of disclosures, and it's joint with A.J. Chen, who is a Ph.D. student here at the Marshall School of Business. Uh, you should be looking out for him in two to three years. He's got an early start, and he is outstanding. And also with Max from the University of Maryland, who I'm sure many of you know well. So um, the motivation for this paper is to me very straightforward, but let me bring it out. And so what we see in the literature is that life cycles is a very strong theme in other disciplines, in particular economics um, and even strategy and management. But, and, it, and it actually dates back a very long time. So we actually think about this area as being quite seminal in sort of thinking about economics and, and business and, and we were very surprised, given the interest that we have, and we, we think that others should have, that it's not highly represented in the finance area. Um, however, there are some notable exceptions, some very interesting and important work, uh, primarily by Renee Stulz and a number of co-authors, including Loderer, uh, D'Angelo, Wyelchley. Um, and, and so what we wanted to think about here is to note that, that these existing studies, they focus on rigidity and firm life cycle. We, we still, while we enjoy them, we, we see some significant gaps in the literature. First and foremost, the existing studies of life cycle focus on firm age as the notion of life cycle. You get older, therefore things should change within the firm. Okay, but in our perspective, when we look at the literature, it appears to be the case that life cycle cannot really be captured by a one dimensional concept, which I will show you shortly. So our take on, on the literature is that not only has it been limited by the issues of data and measurement, but in addition, uh, we also see that the literature hasn't really yet tapped into the concept of disclosure in the life cycle as far as an economic thesis. And, and that's really where we're coming from. So, our approach is to study disclosure, but we also feel that the measurement problem demands uh, being treated, and we're going to use some natural language processing as our solution with a focus on 10K text, and we're going to try to get an annual snapshot of where firms are in the product life cycle. So 
Um, you know, my, my advisor always told me that uh, one paper should have one very stark and memorable takeaway. And I only have 30 minutes here. And I wanted to convey um, what I think is, is a very memorable takeaway to me using a metaphor. And so we're gonna talk about frogs. And for me, that's great because it's early in the morning and that can keep me very alert. So let me just tell a quick story about how you, you can think about life cycles in nature. And, and that is with frogs. So frogs, when they're young, they hide. They avoid disclosing where they are because there's dangers to sharing that information. Okay, but what's interesting about frogs is that when they become mature, they actually disclose their location aggressively. That's what you hear at night. The main conclusion from our paper is you simply replace frogs with firms. So firms, when they're in the earlier stages of their development as a company, and particularly in the product market, uh, we're gonna show that they disclose a lot less, that there's a lot of danger uh, out there to disclosing. However, as firms become mature, and this is probably the most novel part of what we have to say, given the literature on disclosure as we see it, is that firms become, in a sense, really seeking out transparency and disclosing a lot more. And, and part of the reason why is that there's a benefit to doing so that also we haven't really seen in the literature. And in particular, firms can search for strategic alliances. That is, they can attract other firms and do M&A, um, JVs, um, this sort of thing. And that would be the purview of older firms in the life cycle, which I'll get to shortly. And so we think these results are very novel on many dimensions, but I wanted to actually go a little bit further with the metaphor to show you why we, we think we can go yet one step further because we wanna really show separation from the existing disclosure literature to illustrate the hypothesis we have here. So if you go back to the metaphor for just a moment and we say, well, frogs, when they're mature, they're disclosing. The question is who is the intended recipient of their signal? And easy to imagine that they're searching for partners and that the recipient is another frog. Okay, so in our setting, firms when they're mature are disclosing more. And we wanna suggest, and this is where we're gonna get theoretical in terms of the predictions of our thesis, why it's different, that the intended recipient of the company's disclosure when they're mature at least in part is other mature companies. So the analogy is not just superficial, but it also goes down to the very um, objective function of the disclosure, if you will, both in nature and in corporate world. And so the implication of that statement is that it's not only the firm's characteristics that should matter, it's who's around you in the product market space that should also predict your disclosure. So if you're a mature company and you're surrounded by other mature companies, this concept of joint searching for synergistic partnerships becomes very strong. But if you're surrounded by companies that are in an early stage and you're mature, then there's not as much incentive for you to disclose because the recipient is not there. Okay, so that's really the thesis that we're trying to work through. And what we wanna suggest now is that it's highly testable given advances in data that we have in finance and accounting. And so we're gonna not only use the text of the, um, you know, the SEC's filings, but we're also going to look at the Edgar search logs to examine which company is actually downloading which other company's 10Ks, right? To look for this prediction of who is the intended recipient being upheld in the data. More on that as we get further in the, in the presentation. But just to illustrate why building out the hypothesis in this way is important, because one of the stronger alternative hypotheses you might have about disclosure, because it's very salient in the accounting literature and the finance literature, is that the disclosure is there to reduce financial constraints. Okay, but the key thing about that alternative is that the recipient that's intended is the investor. Okay, our thesis is very 
clear that the intended recipient of the disclosure is other corporations and particularly other corporations that would be mature. And that really is a testable prediction that helps us to separate um, the theory that we're looking at from some of the alternatives. Okay, so that's really, in a nutshell, um, the major takeaways from the paper, and I hope that the metaphor helped make it clear, particularly if any of you are also uh, dealing with a 7 a.m. Uh, time zone here. But in any case, uh, let me now move on a little bit to, to, to place what we're doing in the literature just a bit more, and, and it will help to frame the results when I delve in. And that the first aspect of the literature that's crucial is what I show in black, and that is simply the life cycle itself. Okay, and, and the depiction in black here is the Abernathy and Utterback life cycle, which we take as a given that we wanna test. And so what, they, what the authors articulate there is that it's a product life cycle, not a firm life cycle. I wanna be very clear, Renee's work focuses on a firm life cycle. That's one way that we differentiate ourselves. What we're focused on is just the products the firm has. Okay, in the early stage as you develop the products, and as that matures, you get what we call a dominant design, and then you optimize process, bring down costs. And then when you're done with that, you run out of options to improve cost, you're mature. And here you're going to receive the rents and the dividends and, and the cash flows. But over time, uh, products can go out of favor, and then you enter a state of decline. And so throughout the presentation, I'm going to use the notation life one, life two, life three, life four. Please remember those little buzz terms to refer to these four stages. I will not go back to this diagram. That's the notation we use throughout the paper. And then the second aspect of the existing literature I wanted to articulate is a companion paper to the one I'm presenting today that was really released, uh, you could say a couple years before the current paper. It's uh, with Max. And, and we, in that paper, we focus on this life cycle and investments investment policies. The main conclusion that's relevant to the current paper is that early in the life cycle, firms focus on what we think of as inward focused investment. We call it organic investment, which is R&D. Okay, that's something you do in isolation. CapEx is what we see a lot of in stage two. But the key conclusion from the early paper that is not in the existing literature is that once you hit maturity, the firm's focus becomes outward. And it's inorganic investment that we see a lot of evidence for that this company in life three wants to do M&A and that it's already ran out of its growth options, if you will, in life one. And so that brings us to the red, which are the predictions of the current paper. And that is what we're gonna test is that a company that's in the early stages, just like the, the tadpoles, is going to have not a strong incentive to disclose. It's very inward focused. It's got to fix its product. Um, not much to gain by releasing information and a lot to lose as competitors are, are looking for that information, right? But as the company matures, it has very strong incentives to share information now because its whole objective in an investment sense is to try to gain partnerships in M&A. So that's where we're going in the literature. And now on to the methodology. Okay, so um, the existing literature focuses on age. And, and we see a four dimensional life cycle that we have to model. We can't capture that with age. We see nonlinear predictions across the stages. Um, so we're gonna use a natural language processing and we're gonna use this software called MetaHeuristica, which is a high speed searchable database of 10K filings, among other things. And, and the software has been used in many studies, but it, the key thing that I'm going to focus on is what we call anchor phrase methodology. Okay, this is not the first paper to use this. It's been used in a financial constraints paper with Max and also a paper on offshoring uh, with Katie Moon. And, and what, I, what I want to emphasize here, particularly to this audience, is that it is not a word bag method. Okay, it's not just using a word list and scoring on the words. What's crucial in anchor phrase is proximity, that I wanna see collections of vocabulary within the same paragraph. And I'm gonna show you examples. And when you see them, the, the idea is that because they're close in proximity, 
that we have a very precise measurement of an economic concept, not sort of a, a, a mixture of many different concepts in one. We want to capture just the life cycle stage. Okay, and so we're going to focus on the nearest neighbor words. And let me now give you an example of an anchor phrase query. Okay, so what we're going to look for is paragraphs. Within a paragraph, I'm going to want to see a word from list A. And this word and should be highlighted in bold and pink so you don't miss it. It's not an or condition, it's an and condition. We also want to see a word from this list. If you look at that, it immediately should be clear that it looks like a life one concept to say that you're launching, introducing, or expanding your products or services. And all of the permutations of any of those combinations we want to capture. I want to argue that when you run this query, it's not boilerplate. If it was boilerplate, we wouldn't have very strong results. But let me also articulate that we've dumped out, you know, literally 40,000 of these and, and looked at them. And here's some examples that were just the first ones that came out. And, and what you see is that companies literally uh, talk about specific products that they're launching. For example, the Barbie and the Mariposa doll or a disposable clothing uh, being examples. So we see, a, we see a lot of richness in our ability to capture this life one launching concept. Okay, because I don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna skip through all the anchor phrase queries, but the other stages are very similar. The key one is life three is more nuanced because we have to look for inaction. And so we actually have three lists. Life three, you can look it up in the paper if you're interested. We want to see mention of products, but we don't want to see the action words. That's the key thing to say that you're in a stable state. And so long and short, I'm going to end measurement now, is that for every company, we run all four life queries. So the result is that we, we place every company as a vector into a space that's four dimensional, where we know the fraction of your products that are in life one and the fraction that are in life two and three and four so I, I, want you, I want to be really clear that we don't take a firm and call you just one stage. We represent your whole portfolio of, of products and, and their relative frequency within the stages. And that is a disaggregated framework that allows us to use regressions to really identify the unique impact of each loading of, of life uh, cycle on corporate policies and things like disclosure. And so, other than the measurement that I just went through, everything in the paper data-wise is fairly straightforward, just noting that we also use patent data and Edgar co-search data. Um, I can go through an example like Amazon, note that we have all four of its loadings. And what you see is that its, it's launching exposure has declined over time, while Amazon has really ramped up its focus on process. And it fits the narrative that you see for Amazon that it's focused on its warehouses and delivery and making the speedier delivery, the one day delivery, that sort of thing. Very process focused uh, vision right now. And so on validation, I'm only gonna mention one because I'm short on time, but the key thing here is that I just wanna show you that we're getting very sensible predictions in the data for things that you would expect to be obvious if it really is a life cycle that we're measuring. So what we do is we take a firm year panel and we measure the growth of the size of your business description. And if you're in an early stage, it's gonna be growing is our prediction. You're, you're adding more products, you have more and more business. And in life four, it's gonna be shrinking, but the other stages it's likely stable. And so indeed we see that life four predicts a growing business description and life four predicts a shrinking business description, consistent with the idea that we're actually measuring the product life cycle that we claim. Okay, but now on to the economics. So this is really the thesis. Now let's go back to the, to the frogs and thinking the predictions here is that you're gonna disclose more or less based on where you are in the life cycle. We're gonna focus on four disclosure variables to start with here. And all of them are going to define where higher means more secretive. And so innovation secrecy, you have more trade secrets disclosed in your 10K where you mention explicitly that you have trade secrets, but you have less patents. So we take this ratio here. If you look at it, it's going to be high when the firm has a lot of trade secrets and very few disclosed patents. 
Redaction is another variable that's, that's in the literature uh, that you can ask the, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission not to disclose certain sensitive information. That would be redaction that's measurable. It's been used in other studies. And the more of it you have is secrecy, less information. We also look at a readability fog index, which has become popular in the accounting literature. And lastly, we look at competition complaints. That's not necessarily a disclosure secrecy variable, but it's, it's a proof of concept for the life cycle thesis that we think life one firms are really worried about competition, but not life three firms. So I'm gonna show that one last. And so we run, uh, basically, I just wanna say that they're firm year panels, so very basic. And we have things like firm fixed effects and, and number of controls like size and age, especially age, we can add age squared. And we're gonna focus on the life cycle coefficients for which there will be four. Also the peer life cycle coefficients because what's around you also matters. And this is the main result, okay? So here the dependent variable is innovation secrecy. And I'm only showing the life cycle variables and, and not all the controls. But the key thing is that the more exposure you have to the early stage is you're gonna have more trade secrets and less patents. So more, non-disclosed innovation. But as you get into life three, you're gonna have less of that. So you're gonna have more disclosed innovation. What's also really stark here is that the peer coefficients, this is the average life cycle of your peers, are even stronger. So what's around the company matters a lot. It's not that they're in a vacuum. The more you're surrounded by life one firms who are looking to place their products in the market, the more you're gonna become particularly secretive. And you don't wanna give those firms any advantage because they're gonna attack you in the market, presumably. Okay, so um, going quickly, we see- Sorry, Jared, we, just a yes. very simple clarification here. So the, the peers, are they defined uh, by industry? Maybe your, your classification with, with Gordon Phillips or, or yes. what does that mean? thank you. Uh, they are, um, they are TNIC peers. So yes, I'm using uh, the data I have with Gordon Phillips where we identify industry peers based on the common text you have uh, talking about your products. Absolutely. Um, so thinking about our second disclosure variable, this one is, do you redact more? We see very similar results. Secrecy, a little bit weak in the own firm, but strong in life three. You have less disclosure when you're more mature product wise but particularly strong in the peer effects, uh, even in the life one. More secrecy when you're surrounded by firms that could harm you uh, as far as the competitive position that you're in because they're placing products in the market. Okay, bug index, same results, uh, more obfuscation perhaps when you have more life one, more very clear text when you have life three. And the proof of concept is that we look at competition complaints and we see that this is very strong in the data that life one firms are particularly disclosing worries about competitive position in the 10K. Life three firms are just not focused on that. That's not what's salient to them. What we're gonna argue is that they actually like to, uh, if you will, interact with the companies around them in the product space. They're not afraid of them. They wanna actually do M&A and form complementary relationships with them so they're not really disclosing concerns about the firms around them, particularly strong for the peer effects. Now, endogeneity is always a real challenge in any corporate finance agenda. And I don't claim to have full causality established here. We're working on it. What we did find is an, is an interesting experiment where we have plausibly exogenous variation and, and we have very strong predictions given our thesis about how firms will disclose in the face of uh, a shock to the competitive position you have in the world of innovation. So the idea here is we're going to take the sector, so think about SIC2, a broad sector, and we're gonna look at whether your innovation had a lot of patents come out in this very dated window of T minus 19 years to T minus 11 and think about patent expiration being imminent for these innovations here, because patents typically expire after 19 or 20 years in that range. And we're gonna compare the amount of innovation you have in this old window to the more recent window. And we're gonna lag by an extra two years to ensure 
additional separation from the focal firm's endogenous policy. So think about deeply lagged data where we're looking at, do you have a lot of older innovation that's set to decay and expire relative that hasn't really been maintained in more recent years? And that would, the interpretation is that barriers to entry are eroding and that we're gonna expect other companies to come into this space because it's becoming easier to do so. And so the predictions we have are very stark that the life one firms are gonna disclose less and the life three firms more because they, they life three firms see this entry as an opportunity to form more complementary alliances. Whereas the life one firms are worried about losing their edge. And, and that's exactly what we see. We see a, a strong shift even over the, the own firm effects that favors even more secrecy when it looks like your barriers to entry are eroding but with life three less, and it's uniform across the policies. Economic magnitudes. Okay, so you know you, you may have priors on, on whether this is important or not. And what I wanna suggest is that we're gonna quantify economic magnitudes basically on the life one minus life three wedge. Okay, because the life one and life three are opposite. I don't have time to go through all of them. I'm gonna argue they're large. I've compared it to other things I've done. But one stark fact is if you think about the likelihood of redaction, it's a zero one variable, that it moves from 30% likely if you're low in life one minus life three, all the way to 55%. That's a 25% shift in the likelihood of you trying to hide something from the SEC or from the public that's reading these disclosures. And, and it, even stronger on the fear effects where we move from 22% to 57%. Um, and, and I haven't seen a lot of things in my career that are that economically large as far as a single variable shifting things to that extent. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to have time to go through today is, to me, one of the more, more fascinating aspects of the agenda. It's the sender versus receiver. The companies around you should matter. And that's not something that's clearly predicted in the alternative hypotheses for why these variables could matter. Okay, so... The first result I have in this setting is that we're gonna stay within the firm year panel and we're just going to do an interaction between the own firm life cycle and the peer life cycle. In the prior results, I simply used the levels without interactions, right? So I already showed you what happens with the own life variable and with the peer variable. But now what I wanna say is it's, it's the specific pairs that are high in life one and they're specifically surrounded by peers that are life one. The sender receiver hypothesis says that's where you're really gonna hide. And, and same for life three, that's where you're gonna really disclose because you're surrounded by like minds who are looking for complementarity. And we see that the cross terms have signs and, and significance levels that really bring out that the life of firm and, and peer are not separate effects that add, but that there's really this interactive effect consistent with a sender receiver hypothesis. And so the last test I'm gonna show you, I know I'm running short on, on time, is, is, is to me, in a sense, one of the, the overall most fascinating. So I hope you still have a little bit of energy to give me one more test. And so what I'm gonna show you here is that we're gonna take data from Bernard Blackburn and Thornock, where they grab data from the Edgar search logs. But the key thing is that they use the IP addresses and they're able to therefore test who is downloading whose filing. Is Microsoft downloading Google's filing? And we have all these pairs. And what I wanna suggest is that we have a very strong prediction here because this is the core of our hypothesis that you're gonna be downloading other firms' filings and reading them. And that we, we, we would predict that the life one pairs and the life three pairs really have this high incentive to be searching. Okay, and so long and short, that's what we find. And so life three pairs download each other's filings, life one pairs do as well, right? But the key thing is that it's not just the result in similar, similar, because life two search life two is negative, right? And so we think our predictions are very clear that the stark incentives are in the life one and life three buckets, but not in the life two and life four buckets. And that's really uh, the main result on sender versus receiver. I'm gonna skip some results that we have on, uh, interacting our results with firm age, where we, in a nutshell, show that as firms get older, um, they have a difficult time keeping up with the disclosure that we predict. So they're becoming more 
rigid as Renee and co-authors would predict. We see evidence of that. We also look at conference calls and we find that conference calls are more informative when you have uh, life three firms. And so I'm just going to uh, move to conclusions. I have that it is 7.30. So, um, you know, what we see here is it's, it's a paper on product life cycles and, and the existing literature focuses on firm life cycle. So there's a lot of novelty. We don't see in the finance literature any paper that really takes the product life cycle seriously. We see Renee and co-authors focusing on age and a firm life cycle, which need not be the same thing. Okay, and so the main results are we focus on disclosure and it's these life three firms that are putting more information out there, consistent with an inorganic investment strategy where you're sending a signal to the companies around you in the disclosure space. Uh, we have a quasi-natural experiment uh, that supports the thesis, and we have novel uh, hypotheses about who is the recipient of the disclosure, where we really are grateful to Bernard et al. for sharing their data on who's downloading, whose filings, and we find strong support for some of those predictions as well. We think that this uh, approach uh, is relevant in other areas, not just corporate finance, but also asset pricing, accounting, management, and, and other business disciplines. But I'm out of time. Now, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jerry, for this perfectly timed presentation. Remember, I took a couple of minutes in the beginning, so uh, wonderful. We're spot on. Uh, and now let me move. Uh, let's move over to Jessica Jeffers for the discussion. Uh, and uh, the chat is still open for questions. I keep them coming. But first, Jessica, the screen is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, let me just arrange things so that I can um, see you guys uh, while I try to see you guys while I, while I present this. Um, OK, uh, so uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to discuss this paper. It was, it's a really, really interesting paper. There's a lot in it, so I'm not going to be able to talk about it all, but I, I will do my best to cover what sort of jumped out to me. Um, I, I want to start by just reviewing, you know, what is the main question in this paper? And it's this, how, how is disclosure shaped by the product life cycle? Where uh, the product life cycle is one of four stages that are outlined uh, in Abernathy and Uterbach. Um, so product innovation is this life one stage. Um, life two would be process innovation, kind of scaling up. Uh, life three is maturity, uh, and and the and life four is is kind of winding down. But again, at the product uh, stage, as uh, Jerry emphasized, so this is related to the firm life cycle, but it, it's a distinct concept. Um, and and they they also. Uh, sort of go in depth into that in, in their uh, related uh, concurrent paper. Um, so um, disclosure uh, is measured uh, using um, innovation secrecy, um, redactions, readability. Um, and uh, they do also look at competition complaints, at uh, search activity and earnings calls. Uh, so um, again, a, a, a lot of interesting uh, interesting stuff in there. Um, what they find, the answer to their question is that um, at the product innovation stage uh, or, the, or the life one stage, um, firms want to disclose less. And at, I'm sorry, at, at the um, uh, product maturity stage, uh, life three, firms will want to disclose more. Um, so this is consistent with predictions from their concurrent paper, on product life cycles and investments. So there's some theory behind this. Um, and equally important, it's not just the product life cycle of the focal firm that's relevant, but also the life cycle of peer firms. So you're also going to have a higher taste for secrecy if um, your competitors are in the life one stage and you're gonna have a taste for transparency if your competitors are in the life three maturity stage uh, of their product. Um, and then in the last part of the paper, they do this exercise with patent depreciation waves, uh, where they show that when entry incentives are higher, this exacerbates um, the, uh, the patterns that they find. So product innovation stage is even more linked to secrecy, uh, product maturity even more so to transparency. Um, so I thought this was a really interesting paper, um, lots of different results. 
I think Jerry did a fantastic job presenting where it, it actually seeing the presentations, I could see that that flow a little bit better than I did in the papers. Um, I would say reading the paper, it felt like maybe, um, let's say that as the life cycle of the paper matures, <laughs> that you might start uh, to streamline uh, a little bit so that uh, there'd be maybe more of that central message clarity that you talked about. Um, as someone who's typically outside of the disclosure literature, I also found myself thinking about, you know, what's the most important reason that we care about disclosure? Uh, so I'll have some thoughts about that. Um, I think this text-based definition of the product uh, life cycle and, and the way that they use it is a real contribution. Um, the measure itself is very transparent, it's replicable, um, and more importantly for me, it really highlighted a new way to think about a firm's position and kind of the core characteristics that drive different decisions. So, so I really um, like that. It, it, it's really fun when a, a paper gets you to think about firms in a different way. Um, so that said, even though the measure is very transparent, I, I didn't always find the definition super intuitive. Um, and, and I think maybe just you had examples in the presentation that maybe can, can also be added to the paper. Um, there's also something about using the 10K to define the life cycle measures that are the explanatory variables and to define the um, disclosure measures that are the dependent variables that raised some questions for me. I actually, after thinking it through, I don't think it's an issue, but I do think it's something that might be worth addressing directly. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to uh, think about this uh, patent depreciation wave analysis that they do. Um, this had me thinking about, you know, what would be the ideal experiment? If you could do anything you wanted, um, what would you do? Uh, and, and I'm not sure that entry incentives was the first thing that I would have thought about. I mean, it's definitely interesting. But to me, it read a little bit more like an extension of the main findings rather than this kind of causality test. Um, I'm actually not, I'm not sure you need a causality test, but uh, I do understand why you want to have something uh, that speaks to that. Um, and, and I kind of, I think this kind of goes back to, you know, what's the most important message. So um, let me talk about the big picture first. So again, main question, how is disclosure shaped by the product's life cycle? So there are a few reasons that we care about this. Um, just showing that the product life cycle influences disclosures, helps us understand the micro foundations of disclosures um, and disclosures are, are meaningful decisions that the firm takes. Um, you know, spends a lot of time and resource, firms spend a lot of time and resources on figuring out disclosures. So, you know, you can care about uh, the question for that reason. Um, the authors also point out in the paper that uh, understanding uh, these links can inform regulatory debates, for example, whether the SEC should offer scale disclosures, um, when they should grant redactions, and so on. So that's kind of, that, that's what I took from the motivation in the paper. Um, again, as someone who was outside the literature, I was trying to think even bigger picture. Um, and what came to mind for me about disclosure is that, well, this is um, a key way that we learn about firms and that we diffuse, firms diffuse information in the economy. Um, and so this, actually, if you think about it this way, it maybe places a different emphasis on the different results. Um, so, you know, for example, what does it mean that we learn even less about firms that are in that life one product innovation stage? Um, so you could uh, imagine that this has consequences for raising capital. And, you know, Jerry pointed out, I actually, that they actually want to make the point that this is not, um, driven by how firms want to target investors, but but uh, that the uh, recipient target recipients are peer firms. And th and that's that's fine. I think it could still have knock on effect for um, for how capital is raised uh, or how information is diffused. Um, so I think without changing the focus of the paper, um, you can maybe bring some of that into the conversation and, and whatever it is just a little more clarity on the big picture context that you have in mind could maybe help to streamline the message uh, and, and focus on the, the most relevant uh, stuff. Uh, okay, so I wanted to um, spend a little bit of time talking about these product life cycle measures since those are, are really important for the paper. Um, and like I said, they, they discuss it a little. They discuss the measures a little bit more in their um, concurrent paper. Um, there are four stages of life cycles. Um, these measures are related to firm age, at least within firm, uh, but they do capture a different concept 
uh, Jerry, you know, put some emphasis on that and, and I will do a same. And I, I think this is why it's so interesting. So here's some figures from their um, investment paper where the dashed line shows the within firm evolution of the product life cycle importance. Um, and so you can see that earlier stages tend to diminish over uh, firm life and later stages tend to increase over firm life, but, but they're present at, you know, throughout the life of the firm. Um, and so I think it's actually uh, useful to view this with, with an example. Um, I use Amazon because this is an example that they re referred to in their other paper. It's not as cool as the frog example, uh, but, but hopefully it's useful. So I'm going to lay out the different stages and then tell you what I'm sort of picturing in my mind for that stage uh, and then how it's defined. So you know, for life one, this is the product development stage, it's inward focused. Um, I'm thinking about Amazon just starting out, still figuring out what it is that uh, Jeff Bezos is still figuring out what it is that he wants to do with this platform. Um, and the way that they capture this is to look at um, the management discussion and analysis section of the 10Ks and then look for paragraphs that mention products and services. I'm simplifying here, um, but just to get, you know, give you the general idea and um, uh, product and service, paragraphs that mention products and services and you know, launch, development, uh, expansion, uh, things of that nature. They, they always exclude paragraphs that refer to CapEx and R&D because they don't want to mechanically capture investment. Um, so that's life one. Uh, I think it's fairly intuitive. Life two um, is the scaling up process. Um, I think this stage is, the words are a little less intuitive for me at this stage, but I, I won't spend too much time on it because um, uh, this is not a focus of the paper. Uh, the focus of the paper is on life one and life three. So life three is, you know, the firm has sort of arrived, uh, or, or at least the product has sort of arrived. So uh, the firm is uh, focused on extracting value from existing products, um, thinking of Amazon, you know, now expanding into buying Whole Foods. Um, and so the, the words that they look for now is an, are, uh, as Gary mentioned, essentially the product uh, words, but that indicate continuation more than active, um, or, uh, active undertakings from the firm. Um, I get the logic here, but I think that this is where it would have helped me to have a little bit more validation and intuition. Um, I think uh, maybe in, in subsectors where you can have a different uh, measure of, of this stage, uh, it, it would be useful. Um, so, so just a, a thought there. And then uh, it was actually hard to think of a, a, a product that failed for Amazon because they've done so well, uh, but I did find one example, which is their, the uh, Fire Phone that they tried to launch in 2014 um, and that they uh, ended up discontinuing. So here they're looking for words related to discontinuing the product. Um, product has become obsolete. Um, so like I said, they really focus on the first and third stages um, as, as having the clearest predictions. And so now I want to sort of see how these uh, move over time. So th these are numbers from their uh, other paper that I, I just put into graph form. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, you can see that the intensity of the different stages moves a little bit over time, uh, but maybe not as much as you would have thought or as I would have thought. Um, so here are the different examples I pulled on the previous slide uh, just to sort of show you where that falls. So you've got startup Amazon at the very beginning, um, but you see that that life one stage does persist throughout. Um, the scaling up actually because of the nature of Amazon as a company, they, they're, th that seems to actually continue to increase over time. Uh, you've got a tiny, tiny little slivers of discontinuing products uh, here and there. And then um, the, uh, uh, the, the sort of acquisitions are actually pretty strong throughout, um, um, uh, throughout this time period. So really, this is really a measure that is distinct from, from age is what I'm trying to communicate with this slide. Um, and you th have to think about multiple product life cycles co coexisting within a given year uh, for the firm. Um, okay, so one difference, if, if I understood correctly um, from the paper, I think in this paper, they're not forcing the um, life cycle measures to sum to one. Um, and so in fact, these life cycle measures can be um, positive or are positively correlated, uh, especially life one and life three, actually. So you can be high life one and high life three and low life one and low life three. Um, 
So this is what prompted me to think about whether we should worry that these are text-based measures and we're using text-based measures for um, the outcomes coming from the same documents. Uh, and specifically, you could worry that you know, firms that just don't disclose will have low scores and low outcomes. Um, here's why I think this isn't, this actually is not a concern. Um, so they do um, scale these life measures with the number of paragraphs in the MDNA section. Um, also, th this wouldn't explain why we see a negative relationship between life one and disclosure. You would expect to see the opposite. Um, and the other thing is that the way they construct their disclosure measures, it's not just quantity of words, but it's, it's sort of specific words that they're looking for. So it, innovation and competition words, um, readability, redactions. So, so I don't think this uh, actually is a concern, but I, I don't think it's obvious either. And I, I think that it would be helpful to address this upfront, um, showing distributions of the different measures of the different outcomes, um, sorry, by life stage. I think would also help us to understand how, how this um, relationship evolved. Obviously, from the regressions, we know that these measures are negatively correlated with life one and positively with life three, but, um, or sorry, vice versa. Um, but understanding the variance as well, I think would be helpful to understand whether this is uh, something to be concerned about at all or not. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention here is that obviously, you know, the reason that your measure is nice is because it can be computed broadly for a, a lot of different companies. Um, but uh, there, there's some interesting work by uh, Argente, Lee, and Marrera looking at product attributes to think about product life cycles in the consumer goods market. Um, and there's actually, they have another paper with uh, Bazanze and Hanley um, that's also related. And that could be an interesting kind of robustness tests, see if in, in that subsector, if you looked at that. Um, okay, last point that I wanna make uh, is on what we should think of as the ideal experiment for this paper. So for me, the most important results were on this redaction, secrecy and, and obfuscation loading, um, sorry, this should be positively on the presence of life one and negatively on the presence of life three. Uh, just flip that, um, I apologize. And so if you, um, uh, and so for me, the ideal experiment would be if you could randomly assign the product life cycle uh, and see how disclosures change. So uh, let's say, you know, you would assign one firm more of the life one stage, you would expect to see more secrecy and assign another firm more of the life three stage, and you'd expect to see relatively more transparency. Now, obviously, this isn't possible, but, you know, then you can think of what's the best possible approximation in the real world. And, you know, maybe you can think of... Um, R&D tax breaks as uh, sort of being a shock to um, life one, uh, developing new product, or, or instead if, if a competitor is awarded a big contract or a patent, maybe that sort of decreases um, how much product innovation you're doing. Um, think about life three, you know, which depends on your ability to extract value from stable markets, maybe some shocks to local markets. Um, so obviously this is difficult to do. And so what the paper does instead is it interacts life stage with entry incentives. And the prediction is that these entry incentives um, will act as a magnifying glass. Uh, you know, the prospect of competition will exacerbate the taste for secrecy in life one uh, firms and, and the taste for transparency in life three firms. And this is my last slide. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, now you have an environment with low entry threat and an environment with high entry threat and you would expect to see secrecy dominate relatively less in the low entry threat environment and relatively more in the high entry threat environment. And then um, similarly for life three, you would see that those effects exacerbated. Um, and so I, th I think these are, this is an interesting test certainly, but in the paper it read more as an extension than a test of causality. And I think maybe you can consider leading with more direct tests first or, or maybe you want to reframe on uh, entry incentives, uh, but uh, maybe you'd want to do that later on. All right, I'm out of time, I apologize, uh, but uh, it was really, really interesting paper, lots of new content, um, and uh, hopefully my suggestions uh, have some use. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jessica, and uh, no worries. I mean, as you said, it's a rich paper, so to do it justice with the discussion, it's. Uh, Still an impressive feat to do it even in 18 minutes. So <laughs> thank you very much for that.
And um, Jerry, would you like to take a minute or two to uh, respond to any of the points right away? Yes, absolutely. And, and first, I wanted to apologize that I haven't been reviewing the chat. So I know a number of folks have comments in there. I hope you'll either ask them later or send them to me if I haven't been able to keep up here. And I really wanted to thank Jessica for these are outstanding comments. And we will, um, I, I would say that the paper is in a life two stage, maybe still some life one here. And a lot of the comments you had are very helpful. We were definitely going to look at a lot of them. Um, you know, the streamlining, uh, I'm really grateful that you're, you're making that comment because usually what I've been collecting over time is a desire for more and more and more tests. Uh, one of them that, that I, I do see you requesting and, and others have as well, and I think it's very, very interesting and appropriate, is that yes, a lot of our tests are in uh, 10Ks. And, and so we just added to the paper, the one on earnings conference calls as an example of finding consistent results in disclosure outside of the 10K platform. But we like the 10K platform because it's a platform that's required. Every firm has to be there. And there's consistency across firms on all of the background information so that it really reduces the scope for uh, more strategic or selective effects. Now, um, what, one of the additional conclusions that was hinted at in a lot of what you said that I didn't have time to get into and I wanted to really amplify it here is that when you think about the life one results, you look at the accounting literature, there's a lot of literature that says in accounting before our paper that companies want to hide in the disclosure world because they face competitive um, worries, right? But, but what, what our paper does, and you think about that literature, is that we show that it's, that's not uniform. Okay, it's so heavily researched in accounting that you would take the conclusion from accounting that every single firm, it's just like in your face, it's really, really important that every firm is worried about that. But life one is 25% of the distribution. And that's where that effect primarily lives. And that's another, I think, very important conclusion, even before you start to look at uh, the, the life three conclusions. Now, you also um, had, a, had a lot of really fascinating comments about distinctions from firm age and that age is not 100% correlated with uh, the life cycle. And, and we're actually working on a lot of that now, so more to come. And I think it's a very important uh, issue. And I, I just, I just want to give everyone a quick example of why, why that comment is spot on. And so one, one thing we found in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the other paper on the investment side is that um, when a shock comes, like the financial crisis, what you see is, is a shift in some of the investment strategies that are optimal, that are quite stark within the life cycle. So life four firms, normal times are looking to divest assets and downsize, very sensible. But in comes financial crisis and suddenly they're actually being opportunistic and they're trying to escape decline and they're actually shifting towards R&D. And you think about it is that the, the normal innovative firms are the ones that are constrained. Um, Max and I showed that in the 2015 paper, Life One firms became constrained. So what happened is you, you created an opening for Life Four firms who have liquidity because they've had all these collections of asset sales and they have the liquidity and they jump in and fill in the innovation void. So I, I just, I think it's fascinating a lot of what you're saying in that uh, it also suggests that the life cycle variables have a lot of mileage in terms of testing many other hypotheses um, beyond the one that we have here today. And so uh, I got all your comments down. I, I also really appreciate the comments about causality, which is always challenging and, and your interpretation was very good as well as the suggestions, um, but thank you. Um, I welcome any other comments as well. Thank you, Jerry, for the, for the response. Uh, so we're at the one hour mark. So let me close the official um, part of the webinar and uh, thank you to everyone uh, attending if you, if you need to rush off. Uh, you're welcome to come back in two weeks for our next episode with Alex Edmonds from London Business School, who will talk about music as a measure of uh, investor sentiments in various countries. I really hope his presentation will include some samples. Um, but uh, until then, I see you in two weeks. Thank you everybody for coming and for the comments as well.